Hi, welcome to DECO 3100 Information Visualization Design Studio. I'm Kaz, I'm your lecturer, and over the next semester we're going to learn what is data visualization, why you, a designer, should get good at it, and a third one that I have forgotten. What is data visualization, how to get good at it, and why you, a designer, might want to do that. But before we tackle that, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that I am standing on Gadigal land here at the University of Sydney's uh, main campus, and I'd like to acknowledge that this is the, they are the traditional owners of this space and that this land was never ceded. I'd like to recommend that you take a moment to think about the traditional owners of the land you're on, wherever you are in Australia or elsewhere in the world, and recognise the knowledge and custodianship of those people in that place. First though, a couple of practical things. Classes on Mondays. The timetable says we're going to start at 9am, but I actually want us to kick off at 9.30. You're welcome, extra half hour sleep in for everybody, with a question and answer session with me on Zoom. The reason for that is I'll be putting up videos like this one that you can find here on Canvas or on YouTube that will be covering the majority of the content for the course. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to be doing the telling you stuff bit live. We can do that pre-recorded with a chance to edit and take out my stumbles and silly bits. And then we will still have the benefit of a question and answer session every week uh, in Zoom uh, before the start of the tutorial. So 9.30, it'll probably only run 15, 20 minutes, depends how many questions you bring, uh, to get us started with a QA, and a get a bit of interactive stuff going. And then from 10 to 12, you'll have your tutorials either on campus or remote, depending on which cohort you're enrolled in, a lunch break, and then from one to four, we have our studio time. The class is structured just like the design studios that you would have done before, where we have tutorials, which are primarily about skills and exercises, followed by studio time that is primarily about working on your major projects. More on those later. So, you might be interested to know why you're learning about data viz, seems like a pretty science tech, computer science-y thing, in a design degree. The world has changed immeasurably in living memory. Let's have a look at the relationship between income, life expectancy, and your country of residence, starting arbitrarily the year my grandmother was born. You see there's a huge difference between a small number of rich countries and a huge group of less developed countries. But over time, over the last six, seven, eight decades, that has become a continuum of more rich and less rich with a much smaller gap in between them. What used to be a story of haves and have-nots has over time, through technology, through information, become a story of have-sums and have-mores. The truth is that the difference between the richest and the poorest countries has gotten less in living memory. It is a huge success story. There have been some little pickles along the way and everything is not roses, and we'll have plenty of time to engage with that here in this class. We don't shy away from the unpleasant. But the overall story is that the life of the average human has gotten substantially better. And it is technology, and it is information technology in particular, that has driven much of that change. But it, it's had some pretty astonishing disadvantages too. As a result of all of that mechanization, as a result of all of that industrialization, globalization, information revolution, we live in a world that is now more polarized than it has ever been before, with our filter bubbles, with our closed social networks. There's no longer even the same source of truth you might think that that's a relatively recent phenomenon, and it's certainly something that people have been paying a lot more attention to in the last five, six years. But there's plenty of examples from before that as well. This is a fairly normal viral hashtag, uh, Refugees Welcome from 2015, uh, about September 2015, when there were a number of tragic deaths among refugees trying to get in Europe. There was a genuine moment, a bit of a, a viral movement of people trying to change uh, society's opinion about those folks and help them find and start a new life. Unfortunately, about a month later, the discourse around this hashtag changed for the worse. Because a month later there was a tragic terrorist attack in Paris, and a certain group of people, racists, 
blamed that terrorist attack on immigrants. And they said, this is what you wanted. This is the consequence of what you asked for. The refugees welcome hashtag flared back up on Twitter. And this time it was a very different group of people. You can see in this visualization, the red ones are those who have uh, negative sentiment towards refugees and they are sharing with their networks. And the blue ones are those who have positive. Without getting sidetracked with the details of why racists are being racist, it's immediately clear that these are two groups of people who have very few links between them. They are not actively engaged in a discourse. They are just two echo chambers using the same hashtag on the same platform. They might as well be on different websites. In fact, fast forward five or six years, and many of them are. There is no discussion going on. There is just shouting at people who already largely agree with you. But none of this is news to you. Your generation, and if you are making a number of assumptions, apologies to any mature age students out there, understand that technology, that data, that platforms, that big tech are not a good thing. The, the Silicon Valley dreams of my childhood have, as is always the case, brought with them a host of new problems. You know that computers didn't solve all of our problems like we were promised. They just created a whole bunch of new ones that were intractable, that were messy, that were almost impossible to even get your head around. And that is the role of data visualization. Take climate change, for example. This is a Sankey diagram, we'll learn more about those later on, of how energy is produced and consumed in the US. I could only find good US data, I'm afraid. The first thing that this shows you is that that's an insanely complicated picture. But the second thing that you can see is even the things that we think of as huge contributors to carbon emissions, to climate change, are actually only one slice of a very big, very complicated pie. Let's look at that purple ribbon, for example. That purple ribbon is cars. You can see it comes from over the left, petroleum that is produced and distributed, so in other words, fuel that's not used for making electricity or anything. And then it is about 27.5% of energy use in the USA. So that means if we could get every single car changed to an electric vehicle, that would only be a quarter of the energy use. You have to also consider that another quarter of the energy used in the US is industrial, and then another 11.5% is residential, and that sort of 9-ish percent is commercial, and so on and so on. You can also look over on the left and see that, at least as of 2017, this is the latest data I could get, renewables represent a tiny fraction of energy produced in the USA. Of course, things have gone a little bit better since then, but it's still nowhere near a solved problem. Changing your own behavior is good, simple slogans are useful, but at the end of the day, it comes down to incredibly complicated data-driven decisions. Because data is the language of these insanely complicated problems that we find ourselves confronted with more and more. Data visualization. You, as a designer working on data visualizations, can take these ridiculously complicated problems and carve off just a slice and maybe try to make them a little bit more transparent. But at this point, you might be asking, why me, though? Isn't data viz something that engineers and scientists do? What have I, an interaction designer or a service designer or a product designer, got to offer in this field? Why me? Well, the first thing I'd say is that, yeah, data viz is something that scientists and engineers do, but so is sketching. So there's no problem if those skills are shared across disciplines. But the actual answer is that as soon as something needs to be understood by someone else, as soon as the purpose of the visualization is to communicate to a non-scientist, to a non-engineer, you need a design. Communication is a design problem, and communicating with data is done through this kind of visualization. Your skills, interaction design skills, human-centered design skills, are the skills that data scientists and engineers need to take this ludicrously complicated stuff and change anyone's mind with it. And we are going to need to change an awful lot of minds. So that's my argument for you today. Data viz is a design problem, at least as soon as you're making your visualization for anyone but yourself.
The key principle of any design problem is simplicity, right? And that's the same for database. You need to make things as simple as you can, but no simpler. I think that one might actually be an Einstein quote. The way to make something complicated simple is the same as for everything else. Understand who is going to use it, understand what they know, and then understand how to package the information in a format that helps them achieve their goals. It's design. Not convinced? Let me give you some examples. This is Clipsal Solar Pulse, an app built by a company that sells solar energy and battery solutions to convince their users that they had spent their money wisely. This doesn't just help you monitor where your energy is com currently coming from. Is it coming from panels? Is it coming from the grid? Are you charging up your battery, etc.? It does all those things. You can see on the left there, you can see like where's the energy coming from and where's it going to. But what it actually is designed to do is to convince people that they are saving money, to teach them how the panels are saving their uh, electricity bill, or to encourage them to come buy a battery or install more panels, etc., to get even more savings. The screens in the middle show savings. How long have you got to go? When are you going to expect to exceed your initial capital cost of having the panels installed? This is clearly a persuasive interaction design. This, by the way, was actually made by a 2006 design computing graduate who was at the time working for a data visualization firm and built this for Clipsal Solar. Another example. You may have seen this from a couple of years ago. This was built after the 2016 census. This is SBS wanting to demonstrate the diversity of Australia, wanting to show how Australia is changing and what it means to be Australian in 2016. You could use it to go through what is the percentage of people born in Australia, born elsewhere, where were they born on a kind of postcode level. But the thing that I want to point out is that this was made, again, actually by another design computing student, this was made using wireframes and mockups, the same design language that we use in any other design problem. If you want to convince someone of something with data, if you want to change their mind, or if you want to explain something to someone, if you want to teach them with data, then you're going to need to think like a designer. It's a combination of human-centered design and data analytics that are needed to get the job done. And that's what we're going to learn in this subject. Along the way, we'll learn just enough about data and analytics to get by. We'll even take a peek into the wild and crazy world of AI so you're not blindsided by anything happening there. And we'll teach you to walk the line between talking about the data and talking about the people. I'm super keen. I'll see you in the Q&A session at 9.30 on Monday morning. And I encourage you to watch the other videos in this first week's series that talk a little bit about the history of data viz and also some super important practical policy stuff that you always need to know when you get into any subject. I'm just editing this video and I recognize now that there are some huge troubles with the audio. We will get that fixed for next week.